Furthermore, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he did one for all, when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. This is the word of the Lord. Creator God, we are thankful for the life that you have given us and even more thankful for the fact that you have redeemed us through your son, Jesus Christ. We are inspired and so pleased to know that your Holy Spirit has worked in the life of the church to inspire scripture and to inspire us now as we read it. You and I know that without you, I can do nothing. So may these words be faithful and true and good. Help us to take them and put them into our hearts so that our stories and our lives may be forever changed. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. One of my very best friends back home is the consummate carnivore. He loves to eat steak more than most people. In fact, every time we have a time of celebration, he says, let's get some steak. Sometimes it takes the shape of grilling in the backyard together, but oftentimes he calls the community together for a trip to Alexander's Steakhouse. We were in seminary together, and at the end of every semester, he made it customary to call a group of about 30 folks to Alexander's. It's not just a steak place where you order steak. It's a steak place that you cook your own steak in. There's these big freezers with thick cuts of meat just scattered about and huge grills that men like to go up and stand around with beer in the hand and steak on the grill and a baked potato going, oh, oh, oh. That's what you do. You start barking like dogs when you're up there, <laughs> salivating over the steak. He was the most meticulous, surgical cutter of a steak I've ever seen. He used to get down in the nitty gritty, and at the end of his steak eating session, there would be nothing left on the plate except for the most perfectly cleaned ribbon of fat. And there was no flesh on this fat. It was just the fatty fat part. Man. He wanted all the goodness of the yummy steak in his mouth and his belly. He just, he left all that other stuff on the plate. You guys are getting hungry, aren't you? Me too. And here's the thing. That's how the church has historically functioned when it encountered cultures. As the church expanded and went as a missionary force into new places, it looked at culture and said, well, what is good and beautiful and true of this culture? We'll take it. And we'll just leave the fat, leave whatever we don't think is good and true on the side. That's actually the best way the church has done missions. It's the most successful stance and missions it's ever done. In fact, that's what happened when the ancient church found its way into the shores of North Britain, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. There it accompanied and was accompanied with, uh, by meeting, pardon me, there it confronted and met a Celtic pagan people who at the end of the fall practiced a certain holiday that they called Samhain. Samhain. It's an interesting holiday, really. It's kind of a New Year's celebration because it's the time in the calendar where everything's getting darker and you light up the night with fire. But they did so festively to celebrate their harvest. It's kind of a harvest celebration. They had a few metaphysical beliefs that shape its practice. They thought the spiritual world was, for some reason at this time, nearer and closer to the physical world. They called it a thin time or a thin space. The possibility for a spiritual agent to transgress that boundary and come into our world was quite, quite possible. And so they used to put food together and place it out in front of their homes just in case one of their long-lost relatives who lives in the spirit world does transgress 
and finds themselves back into this mortal coil and a bit hungry. Trick or treat, anybody? Oh, they also were worried about the big bad villains in the spiritual world, the people who could spook them and haunt them. So they donned animal skins and animal heads to disguise themselves. It's a bit of camouflage, really. And with these, you can find a little bit of the roots of our Halloween practice right there, dressing up and trick-or-treating. There's a whole lot more that's shaped Halloween, but it was really the ancient church as they encountered these people. They said, well, what's good about all that festivity and practice? Well, it's kind of a day of the dead celebration. And, you know, the church is always thinking about our life in Christ, which includes our death. And so they said, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's put a festival right there with it. And they called it All Hallows' Even, or the evening before All Saints' Day. We call it Halloween. It was shortened to that phrase later. That would be a great festivity that would anticipate November 1st. And on November 1st is going to be the day that we remember all the saints. Now, not just our local saints or our patron saints. We're going to think about all the saints on that day, whether it's St. Peter, Paul, or a later Saint, like St. Francis of Assisi, they'll all get their doing proper on that day. And later, November 2nd became known as All Souls Day, where they would simply remember not just the heroes of faith, but everybody else who has gone before and preceded us in death. Now, culturally, there's a lot that's changed with Halloween, a lot that's been added to it, but Culturally for us today, it's really a time where we take the taboo fringe of life and we put it right in the center and we put it in light and look at it for a moment. And we say, it's okay at the time to do that. It's a time when we maybe confront some of our worst fears in a way that doesn't make us ghoulish because everyone's doing it. Or it's just a time of festivity and candy. Religiously, religiously, if done well through the centuries, here's what Halloween was to be about for the Christian It was to be about honoring and thinking of the dead, thinking of those who've gone before us in a manner of respect. Because you know what, friends? When you think of the saints, you're thinking about people who lived the faith well. And in so doing, you you ought to be inspired to live the faith better in your own time and space. That's a very human need, isn't it? To look into the past and be inspired for today. Every time I go back to Illinois, I go to the Norfolk Cemetery, and I go visit my grandfather and my grandmother's grave, Donald Frank Berkey, Gloria Berkey. I look at the dates, you know, the birth date, the death date, and then that little dash, that little dash. It's representative of entire life, of an entire story. And I think about my grandfather's story because it's shaped mine so very deeply. He's the guy you've heard me say before who drug my whole family to church. I'm here in part because of him. Then I look at the foot of his grave and I see that plaque that's put in the earth and it says, U.S. Navy, World War II. I think about his heroism. My grandfather believed in the American war effort so very much and he thought Hitler needed to be stopped so very much that he lied about his age and got in at age 16 years old. You can do that. He was an immigrant. He didn't have papers. (laughs) Well, he was in the Navy, and I used to ask him as a little boy. I sat on his lap. I said, Grandpa, did you ever have to kill anybody? It's a ghoulish question children like to ask. He used to say, nope, never had to. I really didn't know what he did in the war until later on in life when I collected a a box of his photos and dug through them. There's a a box here, or a picture here of him sitting in the hull of the boat, I think, with a few other guys and his crew peeling potatoes. And there's a mound of potatoes next to him. He's just smiling, peeling potatoes. The next picture was him on an island in Hawaii, standing next to a very beautiful Hawaiian woman with a lay around his neck, and he's smiling huge. The next picture, potatoes. The next picture, him and a few buddies in front of the Acropolis in Greece. Next picture, Potatoes. Next picture, him in front of the Colosseum. Oh, he traveled the world. He loved his time there. It doesn't change the fact that he was heroically interested in getting in and doing something for his country. And I think about him often, and I think, do I live a life of such noble service? Well, that's what Halloween's about. It's the reason that Colleen and I have had Halloween parties every year that we've been married. 
We like it all. We like the kitschiness of the thing. If you come to our house now, you'll see happy ghosts in the lawn. They're happy. I've got children. I'm not a bad parent. I've got spider webs all over the kitchen, and they're the fake kind. They're not, we're clean, okay? They're the fake kind of spider webs. We got all that kind of stuff. Oh, we like the spooky things. I, I like to watch those Universal Studio films, you know, Dracula and the Bride of Frankenstein. But we like the harvest festival aspect, too. And so we have like a Thanksgiving dinner. It's our hope to do that every Halloween, bring in a turkey and everything. Oh, we like the revelry. We have fires and friends. But we really like this religious aspect of it. And so at every one of those parties, we like to raise a glass and say, to those who've gone before us, and pause momentarily to think on their lives. It was at our very first Halloween party that my friend, the meticulous steak eater, he raised his glass first, and he said, to my mom. You see, she died when he was 15 years old, but she was a saintly woman. His faith was built on hers. And he said, to my mom, who always reminded me of who I am and whose I am. Friends, this is a deep, interesting thing for people to do. Look back on the past and be inspired by people who live so well. Who else do I reflect on? Well, I often reflect on the Reverend Harrison Wallace. He was from the South, but he lived in Illinois, so he had a folksy nature to him. Liked to go by Brother Wallace. First preacher I ever knew. Preacher in that church for 30 years. I watched him preach even when he was going through dialysis. Took it out of him, but he did everything he could to keep serving the church. Well, after he died, there was another minister who came in and told us about Brother Wallace. He said, you know, we were at some event. We had to bunk together, and every morning at 4 a.m., I could hear him murmuring. I'd look over, and there he was on his knees praying. He prayed every day from 4 a.m. to sunrise. We'd have these big church prayer meetings. I don't know if you've ever been to an old-fashioned church prayer meeting, but it would be on Sunday night. Once a month, we'd gather in the sanctuary for an hour and a half of prayer. And we would spread around the sanctuary and we'd popcorn pray. You'd say one prayer and when, they, when someone stopped talking, then you could voice your own. And we just sat in the pews. My mom was in her 30s and she always liked to mention that Reverend Wallace would walk down to the front to a kneeler and kneel for an hour and a half, even when he was 80. And she complained about sitting in the pew at age 30. We look back on people because those types of people help us have faith. In fact, being in the presence of people with strong faith, that it kind of makes faith for us a little easier. If you can look around, you can see somebody who just has an unshakable faith. You can look at them and say, well, I guess I can believe if they believe that strongly. Or you look at somebody who just lives so wonderfully the Christian life, and you just think, if they can do it, maybe I can do a little better. Being around these giants of faith and these saints is, is just very helpful for us when we think about doing the task of Christian living. But what happens when they aren't here with us? When their storylines are punctuated? For some of us, I dare say, it can shake our faith. We don't have those great big arrows to God anymore or at the ready, and so sometimes it we wonder, where can we look for a rock, for a light, for guidance? Well, friends, the message of Hebrews is simply this. You have once and for all time a high priest. You have someone in Jesus Christ who sits next to the big guy. I know him, and he knows the right guy. I know a guy who knows a guy. Do you? You see, he is the high priest that is his greatest, one of his greatest titles. And what is a high priest at all anyway? A high priest is somebody who stands on behalf of a people before God and helps the people connect with God. Or also the high priest is the one who represents God to the people. And Jesus is this great mediating presence in our world. We have a connection to God because of Jesus Christ. And here's the key. The Hebrews passage tells us this. His sacrifice is effective. You see, the people had a lot of high priests, but they died. They're not there forever. He is the one who's overcome death. 
The people in the Old Testament used to have to do sacrifices early and often like Chicago people vote. You just had to keep doing them early and often, go on and on and on just to make sure that you were finding your path to God, if you will. Right up until the time of Jesus Christ and still sometimes people still do this. They try to do anything they can to find a pathway to God. But Hebrews tells us this, instead of doing more and more sacrifices at ad hoc, Jesus died himself as a sacrifice once and for all. It is effective. When I first came to Peachtree Christian Church, I was really blown away by the illustrations on the wall talking about this heritage fund business. And I, I asked about it. I said, what's this heritage fund about? And I said, well, you know, and they said in times past, we, if we had a need in the church to fix a window or a heating system, we used to just tap on people's shoulders and say, hey, we need a little extra help. Can we make this happen? And, and so things were done rather ad hoc that way. But there's some visionary leadership at this church who said, no, 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 let's develop a fund that will settle the issue for good, a fund that will sustain itself that if there's ever a need in this physical space, well, it will take care of it. It's a small analogy, friends, but it's an analogy of an infinite and eternal notion that the pathway to God has been done and paved by Christ once and for all, and it's for you. And that's not all, though. It's not just that he's some heavenly sacrifice that kind of clears a debt or something like that. It's more it's that the high priest Christ is always perpetually there for you, too. I was watching UGA football a week and a day ago. It was an awful game. It was awful. UGA couldn't score. Missouri couldn't score. It was just a bunch of field goals, really. Sloppy, sloppy offensive football. The kicker for UGA <clears throat> blew it. He blew a kick. Have you ever choked in front of a lot of people? When you do, it's like you can feel everyone's eyes staring at your backside. You can just feel it. it gives me the wiggles. <laughs> oh, especially when you're a kicker. Blowing it's tough because, like, that's your job. You kick the ball. And then you go and you wait till the next time you kick the ball. So you got that chance, and it's a long time coming before you get to make it back up. That and this kid who missed the field goal is a kid. A college kid, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, whatever. He's just a kid, and he's got thousands of people watching him, breathing down his neck, begging him, praying to God that he'll make the kick, and he blows it. Now, I didn't really ever choke in sports very much. I was pretty successful at everything I ever did. <laughs> but I can't assure you when I did, even my coach got down my neck. I knew that if I missed this shot or if I struck out here, I might be running more laps, doing burpees, whatever. Well, it's kind of terrifying being the kicker who screws up and is on the sidelines. And I noticed Mark Rick, the coach, come over to him, and he grabbed him by the, the side of his helmet and got right up in his face mask, and he said something. I, I couldn't read lips, and it wasn't microphoned. I, I don't know what he said, at least in the moment, but it, it seemed kind. It didn't seem bad. You see, the kicker was about to go out and make another kick, and hopefully for the win. After the game, the kicker was asked, because, you know, he made the field goal and they won. He said, what did Coach Rick tell you? He said, no matter what happens, I love you. It doesn't matter if you make it. I love you. If you fail, I'm still going to love you. Can you imagine? I don't care if you like UGA or if you don't. It doesn't matter. Can you imagine somebody who has the fate of your life in some way in your hand just looking at you and saying, it doesn't really matter what happens, win or lose, fail or succeed, good or bad, embarrassing or glorious, I will love you. You don't have to imagine it because you have a high priest who looks at you and says no matter what happens I love you who is standing on your behalf for when those times that you fail saying no matter what you've done I love you and I'm here for you we look in our lives and we know that there are some holes 
There are some storylines wrapped in our storyline that have been cut short. We miss people. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing this weekend that we're going to celebrate the lives of those who've gone before and say, yes, their faith makes mine stronger and be inspired by that. But remember why their faith makes you stronger. It is because they were arrows that always pointed you to the great high priest. And even though they're gone, even though those points of light may be fading from you, there is a greater source of light that shines down always at all times, that's effective at all times, that's near you at all times, saying, I love you no matter what. Creator God, we are so thankful for the high priest, Jesus Christ. We're so thankful that he has come to make you known. We're so thankful that he stands on our behalf. We're so thankful that his sacrifice is effective for all time. We say thank you, thank you, thank you that you love us when we're unlovable, that you touch us when we're untouchable, that you draw us near when we're being nasty, rotten, selfish creatures. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us a high priest who's always there, in his name that we pray, amen.